We had the best time doing the initial breakdown of the body language and behavior in this video, and we decided we'd revisit some of our favorite moments from it. So the first question is if I can have your first and your last name and spell them both out for me. Okay. Jennifer Soto, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-S-O-T-O. -E Mother. Mother. Jennifer, tell me how you feel right now. I feel like I can't breathe. All I keep thinking about is, where is she? Is she safe? Is she okay? But we're, we're all a wreck. My entire family is a mess. We're just so worried. When did you first realize, or when did you file a missing report? We filed a missing report. Uh, we called the police at like 4.45. Yesterday, uh, 4.45 p.m., but she actually went missing early that morning around between 8.45 and 9 o'clock in the morning she went missing. Um, we had dropped her off close to the school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. That should be it. Sorry about that. All right, I'll go first on this one. Right out of the gate, it looks like she's got some kind of neurological disorder, which she doesn't. She's just jiggling her leg. I used to do that on here and people would say, what's wrong with Scott? Because when I jiggled my leg, it looked like I was doing this, it looked like I had some kind of disease. But I, I didn't. I was like, I didn't even realize it until I watched it, until I watched me doing it. So that's what we're seeing with her. And it's good we're seeing this because as stress rises, the more that foot or that leg jiggles and we see her start jiggling even more. So this is going to be, as we go through these videos, keep an eye on that. And remember, the more stress she becomes, the more she jiggles her leg. And we can see her stress level go through the dang roof here at some parts. And in this one as well, we're seeing compressed lips. We're seeing all the, the great cues of stress that we look for and teach about. And this is a great example of that. Now, when the dog, when they start calling the dog and she stops and starts smiling, this tells us so much because not only are we seeing things that we know cause stress, we're not seeing a couple of things. We're not seeing tears. We're not seeing the stress or concern we should be seeing in there. We're seeing what is looks to me like fear most of the time. So you could say, oh, she's fearful for what's wrong with her daughter. Is, where is she? Is she going to be okay? All that. I don't think that's what it, I don't think that's the fear that we're looking for at this point or what we're seeing. So when, when, when they finally finish calling the dog and things start quieting down, she quits smiling. She automatically goes, she resets and gets back into that fake sadness she's got on her, on her face. She doesn't even know how to do that. And then when the question starts again, that leg jiggling starts and she starts jumping around again. So let's keep in mind as we go through this, again, I wanna stress, watch this shaking because it makes all the difference in the world as far as letting you know what's happening from a perspective of stress on a human as they're going through questioning like this. And there's a reason that she's feeling that stressed. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so same as you. Interested first off, is is it something about the neurology? Could it be stimming of some sort? And then we get, during her answers, uh, very little eye contact. Her eyes go up. Again, could be something with a with a, a neurotype. It is certainly out of the ordinary in this kind of interview situation to not get direct contact, uh, eye contact with the interviewer. So why do the eyes uh, disappear up at, at, at this point? Again, could be neurotype, but let's 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 see. Uh, the 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 shaking is interesting because, as you're saying, Scott, when the dog is called, everything stops, just mm -hmm. everything disappears. So that makes me think, you know, to your point, uh, this should go up even further under stress uh, around the dog. It everything goes the voice change we heard a voice at the start giving her name and how clear and strong the voice is jennifer soto j-e-n-n-i-f-e-r-s-o-t-o -N -N -E when she starts into the interview that all disappears i feel like i can't breathe that's really interesting it makes me think 
that all of this could be some kind of effect uh, that's being done on purpose. I mean, I don't know for sure at this point, first video in, but it does make me wonder, how are you able to be in this heightened emotional situation and then it stop immediately? Interesting. Uh, oh, by the way, she says we had dropped her off. We had dropped her off close to the school. Let's see what happens to that. Greg, what do you got on this one? So let's talk for a minute about grief, because a lot of people are going to say grief. Scott, I posted over in the chat a picture of her face in a still at 39 seconds. If that's not terror, I don't know what is. And it is not what I expect in this situation. I know people are going to say grief does weird things. Grief does do weird things. It slows your cadence, typically. And the reason it slows your cadence is because your brain is running on two channels. It's running on trying to answer the question you're dealing with and thinking about what's going on. On occasion, grief will drive you to speed. It will drive you to agitated. When it does, it's for one reason. It's help, help, help. It's not protection of self. I see agitation and single focus at protection and answering the right question. That ain't healthy. That ain't good. That ain't my kid is missing. Everything she answers is very specific to that. I'm not going to go into a whole lot other than that, other than to say there are a handful of things missing. The mucous membrane's involvement is missing. She's not cried. She isn't crying. There's no inflamed nostrils. There's none of that that you would associate with this. There's that look of terror, that look of when one of the questions is asked. And then if you want to pay attention to her eyes, I want you to start paying attention now because we always talk about eye movement meaning something. When I ask you to recall something, you go to a place, whether it's visual recall or other, this is kind of dirty and doesn't have enough clarity to be able to say it's visual or what, but she's got starting to establish a place she's going for information. I would poke on that a lot. There's a lot of shifting of pronouns here, Mark. I agree with you. And she said, we had dropped her off close to the school now, we always talk about requests for approval being forehead up, and that could mean, hey, do you get me? Are you tracking? In this case, it very clearly is, do you believe me? Because her voice lilts up at the very end and her forehead's up. This is going to be an interesting one. From here, she's got a lot of cleanup for me if, she, if I'm going to believe anything she's saying. Chase, what do you got? Today's video is sponsored by Aura. I'm excited for this because I've been using this app for over two years. If you didn't know how much private information is out there on the internet about you, when you first see it, it's pretty shocking and maybe a little disturbing. These people that collect all these private things about you are called data brokers, but there's a secret here. They have to take down your information if you ask them to, so they make it incredibly hard to do. So what we do is let Aura handle that for us, and you can do the same. You can let Aura do all the work tracking down and removing all the stuff that you don't want online. And you can try Aura for two weeks for free using the link uh, right at the top of the description down there. And Aura does a ton more than just getting your information off the internet. They protect you from threats that you and even your kids can't see coming. And it's super easy to set up. You don't have to go download a million different apps to get all the benefits that Aura has, like parental controls, antivirus, VPN software, password management. They even have identity theft insurance everything. One of my friends was over here sitting in this office just a week ago, and I typed his name in, and within just a few minutes, we found everything. Even his anonymous accounts were on the dark web and the passwords associated with those. He downloaded Aura that night. So you should look into this. Your private information should be private. You can go to Aura.com slash TBP, just like the behavior panel, TBP, right now to start a free two-week trial that I've also linked down in the description. Yeah, one more thing that grief does, almost without any exception, it lowers your priority of, do I need to manage how I'm being perceived by other people? It puts that way down on the priority list. And we're still seeing a lot of perception management here. And we're seeing social behavior, which might suggest that that we might not be dealing with any neurotypes. We're seeing her socialize this interruption by the parrot or whatever it is. And shaking is pretty common and normal to burn off excess energy and adrenaline. We see that in a lot of people. When you see it uh, during somebody spelling their own name, 
you can assume that it's maybe the baseline. And when we say baseline, it's the behavior in this situation with that person. Uh, like Greg always says, not uh, when you're sitting on the couch eating Cheetos, flaming hot Cheetos, either way. So she's kind of launching into a narrative and a story about what happened. And the focus of her answer is on the timeline and the details. She's having a lot of trouble making eye contact. One thing that we're definitely seeing here is the eyelids very rarely close completely. And this is an instinctive behavior. I want to keep something that's potentially threatening to me in my view. So I'm not going to close them all the way. So this is a partial closure of eyelids. And no emotions really visible here until there's the smile that, that we just talked about. It's a smile of self-management, self-perception. And maybe she's thinking the news is going to cut this part out. She goes right back to a sad demeanor after that smile again. And there's no mention of the daughter's name here, which is very unusual uh, for innocent people. Go ahead. So the first question is if I can have your first and your last name and spell them both out for me. Okay. Jennifer Soto, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-S-O-T-O. -E Mother. Mother. Jennifer, tell me how you feel right now. I feel like I can't breathe. All I keep thinking about is where is she? Is she safe? Is she okay? But we're, we're all a wreck. My entire family is a mess. We're just so worried. When did you first realize, or when did you file a missing report? We filed a missing report. Uh, we called the police at like 4.45 uh, yesterday, uh, 4.45 p.m. But she actually went missing early that morning around between 8.45 and 9 o'clock in the morning, she went missing. Um, we had dropped her off close to the school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. We dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Um, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. You can share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I know you had conversations with detectives. Um, not sure what that conversation <clears throat> is, but whatever you feel comfortable sharing that we'll put the awareness out there. Yeah, she was uh, spotted walking uh, by the church, by the middle school uh, on the cameras. They saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit and then get up and leave. They didn't see a vehicle or anything else. They just saw her walk away uh, around 9 a.m. heading towards the school, but she never made it. Um, yeah. What has the school said? Have you given any contact with the school? Yes, um, that they're doing everything they can. They've given me all their resources. The principal's called me. They've looked at their cameras. Cameras, um, I don't think they've caught anything on the cameras. It's too far away from the sidewalk. Everything is too grainy, so they can't see specific faces. Um, but they've looked. Um, I'm just waiting to hear anything else from them. Is this normal behavior? Not to at all. just not show up or call or text or anything? Not at all, no. Um, she, from time to time, she will leave her cell phone at home accidentally, and that's actually what happened yesterday. She left her phone at home. She went to school. Um, but that happens from time to time. She's got ADHD, uh, her memory. <laughs> She's very forgetful. Um, so yeah, there's no way to 
track her right now because I have, well, the detectives now have her phone. Uh, but this isn't normal behavior now. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, the, the bird was actually a kind of a godsend because it forced her to re, re-ramp her story. And you can see her ramp as opposed to, I ask you a question about what happened. What do you expect the person to do? You expect them to go right into the story. She doesn't. She does a deep breath. She eye blocks. And she didn't go into what happened. This is body language of preparation. Preparation to ensure I deliver the story. There's also sorrow and concern when she's talking about not sure what the she's allowed to talk about. I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. And she does a left eye accessing again, that thing we saw where her eyes are going up in her head and to the left. Okay, let's keep an eye and see, is that where she goes to create or where she goes for memory? Because we get a really damn good example of where she goes for memory a little bit later. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be different. So it's really interesting to watch. That bounce is going pretty good now. And she's mouth grooming. We always say, as you stress and the inside of your mouth gets drier and drier, will groom inside of our mouths to pull away mucus and that kind of thing. And the other thing is the adrenal cycle. When Once you start dumping all these chemicals into your system from fight or flight, your body needs air to burn those. And you can see it ramping up. Her mouth is open. There's really, really a lot of oddity here. She does one shoulder shrug and she does a um, lip compression when she says something about she never made it. We always talk about how you talk to a person in interview or interrogation. If I were talking to this person in interview or interrogation, you get very soft. You need to be very soft with this person. Reach out, touch her, talk to her and say, help us help you. Let me know what, what you know and what you don't know. You get more information doing that than you do by asking really hard questions when someone's missing a kid. There's a couple of times in here, and there's there's a narrow, very narrow band of time in here that she looks very believable and right where she should be. She's got real helplessness, um, She and she's we're just waiting, and her eyes go down the right. She's got some lip compression, her brow tips go up and sorrow. That's all the right body language. She also only uses present tense. Her agitation has dropped. Those are really much better signs for her than the first video. So I'll leave this video hopeful that I'm gonna see a mother who has questions but not involved as we move through this. Right now, this tail end of this video is a lot better than what we saw in video one in the beginning of this one. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. And we're seeing that shaking, maybe let's call it a baseline, until the questions are asked again, then she's kind of locked down. And when harder questions are asked, she locks down that, that shaking behavior. Now we're seeing more of an upward tone. By the church, by the middle school, uh, on the cameras, they saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit. And we haven't seen that with any factual questions, like when she, when she called the police or what her name was. Then uh, Greg was talking about mouth grooming. We're also seeing a lip retraction. When the lips go past the barrier of the teeth, this is typically a need for reassurance. And this is happening at the moment that she's saying uh, she never made it. But she never made it. Um, Right at this moment, she's saying, waiting to hear anything else from the school. I'm just waiting to hear anything else from them. There's a hard single shoulder shrug, prolonged eyebrow raise, kind of seeking approval or do you believe me? Like Greg said in the first video, more lip retraction. And one thing that's happening here is that there's a parent sharing all of the reasons her daughter cannot be found. I don't think they've caught anything on the cameras is too far away from the sidewalk. Everything is too grainy, so they can't see specific faces. She left her phone at home. She's got ADHD, so yeah, there's no way to track her right now. This, I think, is highly unusual, and it presents a huge hurdle for me to think that she's wanting to inspire people or help or inspire hope, uh, that there's a way that this can be done. When somebody introduces, introduces complexities and challenges like this, I've never seen someone do it who's purely innocent. And still, we're not seeing a mention of of Madeline's name at all. Mark, what do you got? Uh, Yeah, so I'm the same with you. That blame that she's putting on Madeline around ADHD and and, um, forgetfulness is, is an odd maneuver in this particular situation. I don't like the look of that. Um, Not that I'm against blaming people for stuff. It's just not right for this situation where you're wanting the kid to be found or you should be wanting the kid to be found, just as you say, Chase. You'd want to be eliminating those things and having more possibility of that person being found, not putting barriers in the way. You're exactly right. Um, Again, we have it. We dropped her off second time. We dropped her off at school. Okay, very clear. 
around that. We dropped her off. Okay, good. You said it twice. Now we know. Now we know you both dropped her off. Um, to your point, Greg, yes, yeah, she's 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 breathing, and we get those some of these bigger intakes, but I'm not getting the rapid breath of something like panic or or concern. And she said earlier that the feeling she had was uh, of, of I can't breathe. And yet we've got a breathing. She's not having to catch up with that breathing. It's not, it's not the panic. So her breathing doesn't match what she's told us is the feeling that she has right now, which I would suggest you saying, oh, I can't breathe. That That's a sense of, of panic. And I'm not seeing panicked breathing at, at, at this point. So that's of interest to me. So second video in, I'm, po I'm possibly more concerned even than I was uh, in the first place. Scott, what do you think? All right. Um, when, he, when he brings up the detectives again, that's when her legs start shaking. I know you had conversations with detectives. Um, not sure what that conversation is. We see her doing that whole bob bobbing around thing that's happened. And again, this still doesn't sound like a mother who's stressed that her child is missing and could possibly still be alive and she's worried about what's going on with her. None of that at all. Then more stress mouth with that question as well, or what I call stress mouth. That's just disappearing lips when your lips disappear literally. And I think uh, Chase made a great point because they go back into her, up under her teeth. They're so She's so stressed at this point. Her voice is calm and normal. It doesn't really change much. It's, it stays almost, there's a couple of cases here in, in a few minutes where we get to fading facts, which we'll talk about in a minute. But in this situation, her, her, her voice stays the same. Her cadence stays the same. The volume stays the same. When you're talking about something this horrific, and as you talk about it, you're you're re-realizing the horror of what may have happened. You don't talk normally. You get all worked up. We've seen it a thousand times on here. You know when they when when they're being honest, because she doesn't do anything. She doesn't change much at all. This sounds to me like it's rehearsed, and it sounds like she's playing this uh, with her with her boyfriend. This sounds like she's ready for this. That's why she keeps saying we dropped him off. So that brings a whole other situation in, into this as well. There's a lot going on with this, but I, I think this sounds to me, it sounds like she was prepared for it. The phone being left at the house, she wouldn't have started with, well, she has ADHD and she gets she's really forgetful. So she left her phone at the house when she left. No, you said she left her phone at the house. We can't track her. You know, she has ADHD. That, that's the second part that you think about because everything is up front. All the details, all the major things are up front in your brain when you're thinking about whatever what's going on in the situation. You you don't go to the details of why first and then say she's left her phone. That that's a red flag for me as well. And that single shoulder shrug pointing toward her chin. He's got ADHD. That makes me think she's bringing that up. I I don't believe the kid had that either, uh, because. Of the way the mother's acting. I think they're adding that, and that's why she left her phone. That's why her phone wasn't pinging around where they where they found her. I, I'll leave it there. It's so much more, and I'll just be covering what you guys cover. We dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Um... I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. You can share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I know you had conversations with detectives. Um, not sure what that conversation is, but whatever you feel comfortable sharing that we put the awareness out there. Yeah, she was uh, spotted walking uh, by the church, by the middle school uh, on the cameras. They saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit and then get up and leave. They didn't see a vehicle or anything else. They just saw her walk away uh, around 9 a.m. heading towards the school, but she never made it. Um, yeah. What has the school said? Have you given in contact with the school? Yes, um, that they're doing everything they can. They've given me all their resources. The principal's called me. They've looked at their cameras. Cameras, um, I don't think they've caught anything on the cameras is too far away from the sidewalk. Everything is too grainy, so they can't see specific faces. Um, but they've looked. Um, 
I'm just waiting to hear anything else from them. Is this normal behavior? Not to at all. To just not show up or call or text or anything? Not at all, no. Um, she, from time to time, she will leave her cell phone at home accidentally, and that's actually what happened yesterday. She left her phone at home. She went to school. Um, but that happens from time to time. She's got ADHD. Uh, her memory, <laughs> she's very forgetful. Um, so yeah, there's no way to track her right now because I have, well, the detectives don't have her phone. Uh, but this isn't normal behavior now. What was the last thing, I guess, that the conversation that you two had, you and your daughter? Um, we spoke about her birthday party. She had a birthday party on Sunday. Uh, she had a great time. Uh, I couldn't make it because I was working, but she had an amazing time. She was so happy with all her gifts. Uh, I, I told her good night and um, yeah, that was it. I, I, I wasn't the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. Um, but yeah. 13? She's 13 years old, yes. 13, Madeline? Madeline. Madeline. Um, what are you thinking right now? In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. This isn't like her to just pick up and run away um, or just not go to school. Um, I don't, know, I don't know what to think. All right, Chase, what do you got? We're still seeing some bizarre behavior here. And keep in mind, as we're saying this, none of us are saying that she was involved directly. And that if someone does have guilty knowledge, they could be covering up that guilty knowledge out of self-preservation because they've been threatened. Because something else has been threatened to be taken away. So we don't know that yet. And maybe uh, y'all will comment on what we see. Maybe there's some threats going on or, or it's just self-preservation. So we'll see. But this shaking still continuing. We see the shaking during the parts that are provable and most likely solid facts. She had a birthday party on Sunday. Uh, she had a great time. Uh, I couldn't make it because I was working. We see the shaking go away anytime somebody's asking details about Madeline going missing. In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. This isn't like her to just pick up and run away. I'm always uneasy, uh, personally, when I see more fear than grief or sadness. And I'm even more uneasy when I see that fear surrounding the story of the disappearance of the child. And to add to this, when I see that a reporter has to remind somebody to mention the child's name. Madeline. Madeline. And remind them also that they're supposed to talk about what they think happened. What are you thinking right now? The reporter's having to kind of prod and prompt this it's a lot more concerning i developed a guide if y'all remember this for the media on how to ask questions and what questions to ask during these interviews like this this guide has literally everything that you would need word for word and has prompts to get somebody like this to talk a lot more innocent people can be less talkative too and it's helpful to get them to start talking as well so i'll, I'll link that down there if you guys are all right with that i'll throw it in the video description Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. After um, she, the the reporter says, what was the last conversation you two had? Again, this is fear. It's not the classic expression of fear. I always say fear looks like a calm surprise because your eyes are open, your mouth is open, and your nostrils flare a little bit because you're you're waiting to see what's going to happen. You know, you're, you've been shocked and then, oh, what's happening? Oh, it's almost like a, an, a lengthened amount of shock is, and it just lasts for a little while. I asked Melinda Ozell about this as well. She's a, she's a big uh, micro expression um, specialist. And she said, yes, that's, that's what she's seen as well. We talked about some other things, details of it, but we both agreed <laughs> that that was fear. So yeah, Chase, that's spot on. And when she answers, again, that leg goes jiggling. And she starts bouncing around like she's on one of those old covered wagons in a Western movie or something. It's a lot there. So she's getting a lot of stress from that question. And, th and then this is where the fading facts come in at the end of that of, the, of that second answer. I was the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. Um, but 
Yeah. When we talk about fading facts, we're talking about someone who who is giving you information that's supposed to be a correct answer or the answer. And as they get quieter toward the end, it's because their brain's saying, You're, we shouldn't be doing this. In other words, we shouldn't be doing this, man. This is not true. So they'll get quieter as they go and down toward the end. So listen for that. We'll hear that a few more times in here because that's classic. That's not one cue shows you that someone's lying or telling the truth. But this is when you start grouping these things together, you can start making decisions about what you're seeing. If you have a whole lot of things that may suggest deception, then you can you can feel pretty good about saying that's probably deception because there's no way to know for sure by one cue that someone is being honest or telling you the truth. That mouth chewing adapter shows up where she's chewing on her mouth and she's doing mouth grooming again, then stress mouth. Everything she's dealing with here is causing stress. Every question causes stress. Everything she's asked to talk about causes stress. Every time they go even just this deep into it, she's, that leg starts jiggling, she starts jumping around. So I think something's up here. I, I, I think there's a lot more going on than I think anybody is aware of at this point outside of, of, of this uh, investigation so far anyway. But then again, we hear when she says, uh, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. We hear fading facts there as well. Mark? Uh, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, fear is is an interesting expression. You're right. It's 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 very similar to surprise, and often, you know, when you're looking at those emotions, it's the one that people will conflate. And, and I think the reason for that is, in in my belief and understanding, is that uh, fear has to be very very subtle because you don't want to show the predator that you're fearful because it will trigger an attack. It has to be subtle enough that the people around you would detect the fear, but not so big that anything, you know, outside of that close distance would see the fear. I, I'm going to go even further that, than than fear, though. I think you, you're absolutely right, Scott, and, and obviously Melinda is absolutely correct, but I'm going to go for its terror. I think we're seeing terror in the face. Why I think it's well, extreme fear. It's fear, but at, a, at, a, at an extreme, and it's still subtle because the signal has to be just for the people around, not big enough for the predator. Now, uh, she has a theory. In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. So that's that's good that she has a theory, but then she changes that, and she says, I don't know what to think. I don't know, I don't know what to think. And, and and that's, I think, the thing that you were getting fading facts on there, Scott. So that's interesting. She's got a theory and that's that's too, that, that's a plus point for her. And then the theory gets taken away with fading facts. So she back, she's backpedaling on it a little bit. And then we get a new piece, a new story. I wasn't the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. Well, last two videos. We had dropped her off close to the school. We dropped her off at school, close to school. But now she's not any part of it. The story is changing significantly here. Why might that be? There's a lot going on in this third one, Greg. So I got the same thing, Mark. I think it is terror. I think it's a mild version of terror, but I think she's shocked and terrified by the question. Shouldn't mm -hmm. be. What's the last thing you said to your daughter? Seems like a normal question. But then that agitation comes back. And we can all recognize shock, fear, terror in faces because, as you guys said, they're more subtle, but we all can recognize them. That's Darwin started that that long ago. She does a lack of, of certainty with that single shoulder shrug, and then she goes to hesitant Cadence, really hesitant. Uh, I, I told her good night and. Um, well, hell, you should remember the last thing you said to somebody like that. That's awkward for me. Yeah, that was it. What? What? You say that after you say the last word you said to her, and here we're back to the truth needs no support but lies, love a crutch. She's going to continue to qualify. I wasn't the one who took her, Mark. She says now. Now we have the, a first person singular declaration of innocence now i'm going to drop back to video two where i saw things that look real i saw things that like hopelessness and fear and sadness and that lip compression and what did she say then we are waiting let's keep that in mind the only time i saw anything genuine was we are waiting and there was a lot of fear and that kind of thing around it now she's saying i didn't do it it was my partner I wasn't the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. Um, and that kind of dropped off. And then, but yeah, a lip compression. There's a whole cluster of red flags right in there. This alone, this piece right here, going back 
and looking at where she was showing sorrow about we are waiting now makes me concerned, now makes me think. And Chase, to your point, could it be that she has a suspicion that her partner did something? Could it be that she knows her partner did something? Could it be she was involved? We can't tell that. What we can tell is there's some behavior shift that indicates something is guarded and something is shielding. And again, I'm going to mention, I don't see any grief or sorrow except for writing that we are waiting piece. I don't see snotty nose. I don't see teary eyes. I don't see grief muscle. I don't see concern in places I expect it. It's just not here. Um, maybe she's just suspicious, but there, that's a hell of a lot of disclaiming right in there. And then she's back to internal voice at I don't know what to think and back to that terror. I, guys, this one starts to look worse and worse. One little glimmer of hope in the second video now starts to look like something. I'm going to look for indicators that there's some kind of collusion going on. That's all I got. What was the last thing, I guess, that the conversation that you two had, you and your daughter? Um, we spoke about her birthday party. She had a birthday party on Sunday. Uh, she had a great time. Uh, I couldn't make it because I was working. But she had an amazing time. She was so happy with all her gifts. Uh, I, I told her good night, and um, yeah, that was it. I, I, I was the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. Um, but yeah. Eight, 13? She's 13 years old. Yes. 13, Madeline? Madeline. Madeline. Um, what are you thinking right now? In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. This isn't like her to just pick up and run away um, or just not go to school. Um, I don't know what to think. Friends, the friend's parents, you've contacted and Everyone. went through every single person? Everyone that we know that she knows. We've contacted them all, reached out to them. The parents have gone out to search and look for her as well. And we haven't come up with anything yet. I've seen a lot of posts on uh, Facebook, um, Hunter's Creek, rants and raves and what have you. Did people um, say that they were going to conduct some type of like search party or anything? Uh, a lot of people have asked me to volunteer like if there is one if they, if they can do one um there i have people passing out flyers going to every store in that vicinity a gas station church um i think people people were being stopped in the street this morning in front of the school to see if they've seen anything if they've heard anything my family is they're going all out right now um yeah. I know as a mother, you know, it, a lot is going on in your brain. Um, so much. To bring her back home. What have, what have the, the law enforcement told you that you are able to share? I mean, that they're doing the best they can. Uh, they've had detectives come out, interview us. They took a piece of her clothing for the canine dog to see if they can sniff her out. I'm not sure when that's being done. Um. All right, Greg, what do you got? So she's really boiling the air down now, if you can't miss. She's inhaling it more heavily, her mouth's open, all that bouncing and terror in her face. And now she's added batter on deck. She's rubbing her thighs. I don't expect all of that when a person is feeling grief. I just don't. Go back to the McCanns, one you guys beat us up about all the time in the comments, where the McCanns were lifeless and you said that was an indicator that they had done something wrong. No, that's an indicator of grief and their brain is running out of energy and that kind of thing. There is not agitation. Now, there is a part of grief that causes people to go from denial to anger, which she's not in anger, she's not in denial as far as we can tell. It feels like she's just in the moment. She's guarding again. There's a nonsense answer that really does mean something if you listen to her words, but her sentence structure is just really poor. Uh, a lot of people have asked me to volunteer, like if there is one, if they, if they can do one. And what she means is people have called and said, if there is a search, I'd volunteer. Or can you help us organize one? And, and, and. Well, here's question number one when somebody says that, that he missed. Did you organize a search? 
are you part of a search? And if she says no, then the obvious why question. There's eye movement now deviation from what she was doing earlier for facts. When she was doing facts earlier, and now she's talking about these people, her eyes are going back to the opposite side of her brain. So something's going on here. Can't tell what until we get further in and we get a clean question. But let's pay attention to this. This is almost telegraphed. Chase, you say it most of the time. Where's my baby? Let's get out there. Any of you, if you're missing a dog, would be, where's my baby? Let's go get this much less a human being. And she's just been handed the question, what would you like us to do? They didn't ask that, but she says people have asked, they have volunteered, but she still doesn't bring it up. She still doesn't say, where's my baby? There's still no grief. There's still no agitation there. The agitation is all about protection and about protection of facts. Every fact that she's bleeding is one that's being pulled out of her. Now, does that mean she did something? No, but it means this is a hell of a lot of red flags that would certainly get my attention talking to her, and I would start pulling and pulling and pulling. And when I say pulling, I'd be real friendly about it until I wasn't, until there's a reason to have some kind of case. Because remember, you're just interviewing this person and you're trying to get to facts. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So I'm interested in the blink rate here because it seems super, super What low. blink rate? Yeah, yeah. you are yeah. Ring, right? Yeah, well, I, did, I think I counted one. I think I did count <laughs> one. So we can, you know, <laughs> we can give a one on that. Um, uh, Chase, I think you're right in 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 suggesting that in, often it's it's the case of a low blink rate is hyper focus. So let's let's take that as let's let's go with that idea because I think it's a good idea. So then we go, okay. So what is she focused on? What is she so hyper focused on here? Now we've got this big eyebrow raise with that as as well. Now, talking about terror and fear, there are some indicators in, in fear. Fear, you want to let a lot of information uh, in there. You want your, your blink rate to be low, so you're getting that information in. Also, the eyebrows are a good way to sing signal to other people in the room that there's a threat in the room. There's something, uh, there's a predator around. So, high focus uh, because of no blink rate, Eyebrows up, potentially, I mean, could be approval, but potentially not approval, could be signaling to others, there's a risk in the room, there's a predator in the room uh, right now. I don't know whether there's somebody else in the room at the same time as this interview or in the, in the certainly a parrot, uh, around and about, um, and, the, and something has disturbed the parrot. Greg, it sounds like you know parrots better than I do, uh, but... but <laughs> But maybe something else in the house has disturbed the parrot and the parrot wants wants feeding. Or maybe the parrot just, you know, shouts out like that at a certain time of the day. I would be interested. You know, what else is happening? What else is in the room? Who else is in the room or in the vicinity uh, at the time? Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, we, we know now that she uses this single shrug as a social acceptance gesture since we saw it really pronounced. She's got ADHD. So she's socializing the issue here in this clip of having spoken to everyone. Everyone that we know that she knows. So she's introducing more difficulty here and complexity again, introducing it, saying they've literally contacted everyone possible. There's uh, no more people that can be contacted, which insinuates nothing more can be done. She's also adding here, that people have searched for her. She talks about her family going all out, which is very different from asking for help. In many ways, uh, this can be seen as something that's lessening the need for any assistance or help from people. And I'm surprised uh, by this point, there's not one mention of her name unless it was directly asked of her and no mention of getting Madeline back home. And essentially she's saying that all that can be done is either happening or has already happened. And at this point, I would assume she most likely, if I was doing this interview, obviously I'm not in, in charge of the questions, but based on this, I would assume she very likely knows the location or disposition of Madeline. And I would say that in likelihood, that's a high likelihood. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you guys. And Greg, going back to your point, ever, but for all of us, if one of if somebody we loved was missing, they wouldn't be able to interview us because we'd be out. So where's where's Mark? I don't know. He he left. He says he's going hunting for his yeah. kid. You know where's where's Chad? Then we'd be gone. There'd be no interview. They'd be trying to find us, but that's where it'd be happening. And I think your shoulder shrug went up uh, at that first part because she really doesn't. I think it scares. Her. I think I think you're right, Chase. I think that that part where at the beginning there where she says, um, 
um, or he's asking about the people are coming by and stuff and that shoulder goes up. No, man, she, she doesn't want to answer that. She's of course she's unsure, but she's really insecure about that. We're seeing a whole lot of insecurity here, man. We're seeing somebody who's afraid. We're seeing fear. Why would we be seeing fear other than being afraid for your, your daughter, Madeline, who is never named in this, you know, never, not once. So let, let, let's think about that for a second. Why would she be doing that? Why would she be pushing away from everything? Why isn't she out hunting for that child? Why isn't she trying to find people to help her hunt for that child? Why isn't she saying, look, hang on just a second. If they do get a free interview and say, look, if you, here's what she looks like. Bang, here's a picture. Please go out and look. I think that bit about the ADHD, I think that's not true as well. I don't think that's true. I think that's why we're seeing that shoulder grow up and that chin go toward the shoulder. I think I don't think the kid has that. I could be wrong. They could she could have been diagnosed or whatever. I don't think she has it. And her blink rate, like you were saying, Mark, it's there is it's it's almost gone here. Going back to your point, Chase, we know that when someone's afraid of something, your brain goes, We need to keep an eye on that. So your your eyes get a little bit wider and you don't blink. And when you do blink, they don't blink completely most of the time. So I, I think there's a whole lot going on around here. Uh, in this situation, we're seeing stress mouth. She's thinking about not getting in trouble. That's what she's thinking about. That's what, that's what it's looking like to me so far. All right. We're good. Mm -hmm. That's a good lean, Greg. Mark, it's very pro. Well, Base, that wasn't much I'm, of a I'm just warming up. I was playing it cool. That's what I do. <laughs> Friends, the friend's parents, you've contacted and Everyone. went through every single person? Everyone that we know that she knows, we've contacted them all, reached out to them. The parents have gone out to search and look for her as well. And we haven't come up with anything yet. I've seen a lot of posts on uh, Facebook, um, Hunter's Creek, rants and raves and what have you. Did people um, say that they were gonna conduct some type of like search party or anything? Uh, a lot of people have, Ask me to volunteer. Like, if there is one, if they, if they can do one, um, there I have people passing out flyers, going to every store in that vicinity, a gas station, church. Um, I think people people were being stopped in the street this morning in front of the school to see if they've seen anything, if they've heard anything. My family is they're going all out right now. Um, yeah. I know as a mother, you have, a lot is going on in your brain. Um, so much. To bring her back home. What have, what have the, the law enforcement told you that you are able to share? I mean, that they're doing the best they can. Uh, they've had detectives come out, interview us. They took a piece of her clothing for the canine dog to see if they can sniff her out. I'm not sure when that's being done. Um, what school? Hunter's Creek Middle School. Tom, any questions? No. Is there anything that you think our viewers would need to know about the way you're feeling, the way the family's feeling, Madeline? We are desperate for any answers, anything that you can do to help. I'm here for it. Just please, if, if you see my daughter, just please bring her home. I just hope you're okay, Maddie. I hope you're safe. I hope you're not hurt. I just hope she's okay. When um, when did you notice that she was missing? Because this was at the beginning of the, the morning. Um, she got dropped off in the morning. We did not notice until after school pickup at four, at four o'clock when I went to go pick her up and she wasn't at school. So we're going in 24 hours now. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. No word, no text message, no messages anywhere from her. I've looked at all her social medias. I've looked at all her games she could have played with, any any app, no weird conversations, no, nothing strange. Everything was conversations with just normal friends or us. 
that she knows how to get home by herself as if like let's just say take a, to take a bus or an uber or something like that she would know how to get home alone correct i'm not sure i don't know if she would know how to get home maybe i mean if someone i'm thinking if someone got in the car with her and, and if she pointed the way what roads she probably could figure out how to get but like does she know a full address i don't think she, i don't think she does which would give me the which i mean it just puts in my brain that she always comes home with you with someone she always comes so home with there's me. no need for her to really exactly. learn okay and you said no time he knows everything all right mark what do you got well she does ask for help in the end she does use her her name but it's taken taken some time uh getting there so a little bit too late from my point of view. I just hope you're okay, Maddie. I hope you're safe. I hope you're not hurt. I just hope she's okay. There's lots of upward inflections there. I would like more force uh, within that. If it's a, a, a sincere um, call out to her daughter, that, that there's the possibility that she could be hearing her, even if she's captured in some way. Uh, and and then there's a, a complete change in voice and attitude from being passive, which she's, which we've heard of before, to being now uh, and passive and kind of helpless, to being active when she's describing how she could direct somebody. I don't know if she would know how to get home. Maybe, I mean, if someone, I'm thinking if someone got in the car with her and, and if she pointed the way, what roads, she probably could figure out how to get, but like, does she know? full address i don't think she, i don't think she does a really big change again we're always looking out for changes i can't really make head or tail of why that change but it shouldn't really be there there's no necessity for a change there and it's almost like an affect gets dropped for this kind of passive helplessness that we've seen her in suddenly gets dropped immediately it's like it's been an act of, of some sort. I find it very, very odd, these quick changes that are going on. Uh, Greg, can you make any sense of it for me? Yeah, I, I'm back to what I said in the beginning. When you're grieving, your brain is occupied on another category and you are responding to what's given you. It is not your single obsession to chase. You call it socially focused. I think it's fearfully focused on what this person knows or doesn't know and trying to make sure you're managing that as you go. And I think it is social, but I also think it's fear driven. And I think when you're facing grief, you said it early too, you don't care. I don't care what you think. I want my kid. There's way too much focus, Mark, on what this person thinks is what I think you're seeing. Her intake eye is damn near closed. Now look at that left eye. Mm -hmm. It's closed down real tight. <clears throat> we have not seen a single tear, not a grief muscle, that arch series of muscles that shows that very little concern. There's no membrane, no mucous membrane drainage. She says at one point she we didn't get a text message. No word, no text message, no messages anywhere from her. Well, you told us the phone was on the counter. How did you expect a text message? So I think she's now just rifling through what she thinks she's supposed to. Feels a lot like she's got a list of things. And then her baseline for visual is not what she's doing as she describes her actions. We just saw what her baseline for visual was. And now she's going somewhere else when she's saying, I did this and I did this and I did this. There's a big deviation when she's talking about games and apps. I've looked at all her social medias. I've looked at all her games she could have played with. And any app. She's back to that narrowing of the face and that dismissing with her face and her, her bouncing is increased. I think she's in circuit overload here. At one point, she can't understand what the guy's asking questions. And then when he throws out that life ring about her coming home with somebody, he, she'll grabs at it because it's back to her being able to get connection with the guy again. Again, I'll go back and say grief doesn't agitate. Grief slows. Grief causes you to be more contained and zombie-like. Agitation comes when there's a reason why you're trying to get contact with somebody or to hide something or do whatever else it is in there. And that can be, now that agitation can come out in, I want to find my kid, but that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing agitation at perception management. Chase, what do you got? Perception management uh, is what we're seeing, for sure. I agree. And I think she's afraid to ask for help. So there's six ways that I teach 
people are are driven and social needs or the need for acceptance is one of those. And that's what we're seeing here. Having the need for acceptance means that you naturally have as a byproduct of that, a fear of tribal retribution or pissing off the tribe. So asking for help and then this information coming out later means that she will face the wrath of her tribe. And that's what I think we're looking at here. <clears throat> they give her the entire floor here to say whatever she wants. Is there anything that you think our viewers would need to know? And the first thing that we hear, she asks for answers. We are desperate for any answers. Not the daughter back. And then she says, if you see my daughter, just please bring her home. If you see my daughter, just please bring her home. If she was taken, I don't think that's what she would say, no confidence in this at all, and just kind of assumes that she wasn't taken, maybe lost in the streets. But just a few seconds right before this, she said in her heart, she feels like Madeline was taken by somebody. In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. And in this moment, she's saying, I hope you're not hurt. I hope you're not hurt. Try to mimic her behavior when she says, I hope you're not hurt. Mimic her facial expression, her tone and her breathing. See how you feel if you copy what she's doing. And I think that will give you a magical key to see behind the scenes here. At the moment of saying, I hope you're not hurt, something goes off in her head and she freezes. And I just think she doesn't know what to say. I also think that phrase, saying it out loud, is mm -hmm. something that's sending her mind into dark territory. And she could be recalling something she knows to be true or something she's fearing or something she actually saw. I've never heard a parent say anything like this in one of these videos. This pause that she takes after saying all of this hit me in the stomach watching it uh, this morning going through these videos. Scott? After that first question, it's dang downhill all the way. That leg gets jiggling. Her blink rate is almost stopped. She looks, it looks like her eyes are frozen open, except for that one. Uh, it's all squinched up. It's all, like you were saying, Greg, it's damn near closed. This, this for me, like from from video one, I said, something's not right here. And then the, the more we go, we go forward as, as we talked about before we started this I, I think she's I think she's in there I think there's collusion in there somewhere but the end of her thing we hear more fading facts I just hope she's okay I'm trying to add things you guys haven't already talked about but I don't think I am what school Hunter's Peak Middle School Tom any questions no. is there anything that you think our viewers would need to know about the way you're feeling, the way the family's feeling, Madeline. We are desperate for any answers, anything that you can do to help. I'm here for it. Just please, if, if you see my daughter, just please bring her home. I just hope you're okay, Maddie. I hope you're safe. I hope you're not hurt. I just hope she's okay. When um, when did you notice that she was missing? Because this was at the beginning of the, the morning. Um, she got dropped off in the morning. We did not notice until after school pickup at four, at four o'clock when I went to go pick her up and she wasn't at school. So we're going in 24 hours now. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing, no word, no text message, no messages anywhere from her. I've looked at all her social medias. I've looked at all her games she could have played with, any any app, no weird conversations, no, nothing strange. Everything was conversations with just normal friends or us. Did she knows how to get home by herself? As if like, let's just say, Take a, to take a bus or an Uber or something like that, she would know how to get home alone, correct? I'm not sure. I don't know if she would know how to get home. Maybe, I mean, if someone, I'm thinking if someone got in the car with her and, and if she pointed the way, what roads, she probably could figure out how to get, but like, does she know? A full address? I don't think. She, I don't think she does. Which would give me the. Which I mean, it just puts in my brain that she always comes home with with someone. She always comes so home. There's no need for her to really exactly. learn. Okay. And you said no time. 
he knows everything. All right, now let's do a final verdict opinion of what we've seen so far. Uh, with all the videos we've looked at, all the things we've talked about, let's talk about what we actually think is going on. Mark, what do you got? She knows something at this point. She suspects something or she has... Uh, or she's involved in in some way. I don't know which one. I'd be speculating if I if I did. But she's not giving us everything there. Probably time will tell what the situation actually is. Chase. Yeah, I'm, things just aren't adding up. I'm not sure the mother was arrested or not. I don't know, but it looks very unusual. And I've personally, outside the behavior panel, and all of us have, I've analyzed several hundred of videos like this. And I hope the media gets a hold of that PDF. It would make it would make your interviews better. It would make our analysis better. So I linked it in the description down there. And none of us are forensics experts. And behavior alone should never put anybody on trial. But behavior should drive focus and attention until the truth is found. And I think maybe some attention needs to be paid. Greg? For me, while I can't say this woman knows anything, she certainly has a whole lot of indicators, red flags that would cause me to say, what does she know? Does she have a suspicion? And that's the reason for all of this kind of wonky body language, or is it something much deeper? Because what we see here are two strategies. One is a grieving animated, not realizing that grief takes away your thinking brain and you're not protecting the self. And the other is this emotional deep in a well person, both of which are about this person, not about the missing child. The missing child should be center of mind for anybody who is not worried about protecting self and image. Don't see it. I bet we see more out of this. And that's my opinion. Scott, what do you got? All right. Here's what I think is going on. And again, this is just an opinion. Just what I think could be wrong. There you go. Before I say this. So I think the key word here is we. They both said we, they both used we when they're talking about dropping her off at school. She had to define afterwards that he was her partner. He did it. My partner dropped her off. He was, he was pretty much doing the same thing when he would say we. So there's that connective word, we. They're both saying that. She's She looks scared. She looks afraid. She shows every sign of, of fear and terror that she's going to be in trouble too, that she's holding something back. She's talking the same way he's talking. They, their stories are very similar. They sound they sound the same. Everything looks like they've colluded. Everything looks like they've been talking about what happened and discussing it. I th in, my, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, could be wrong, don't take this for a fact, but I think they are to uh, together on this. I think she does know about this. I don't think she had anything to do with killing the child. But I think she knows about it. I think she, well, obviously she knows about it, but I mean, I think she knows what happened. I think she knew what happened beforehand during this interview. I think she knew what happened and is trying to hide that. That's just what I think. But that's what I really do think. And if you, and, and like I said, the people doing this in, investigation, fellas, ladies, heads up, talk to this, this woman a little bit more. She knows a whole lot. You probably already know this and you may be going, dang it, what's that? Why is he saying, why is he telling her, giving her a heads up? Sorry, man. Um, so, all right. Thanks for another good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?